Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's most distinguished writers and authors. She's been awarded the Sahitya Academy Award, the Gyanpeet Award and has been globally recognized and applauded for the passion and the integrity of her writing. Indra Goswami. She has been Assam's window to India, India's window to Assam, in fact, the world's window to Assam and Assam's window to the world. I'm delighted to welcome you, Indraji. <laughs> thank you, thank you very um, much. <laughs> you have written with so much passion uh, about so many different parts of India, mm -hmm. bringing to it, in a sense, an Assamese sensibility. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite unusual, in a sense, for a, 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 a someone writing in a regional language. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a unique contribution to present India to the Assamese <laughs> uh, in, in, in their own language. Uh, how have you been able to go and, and, and pick up the texture of such a varied landscape from Vrindavan to Kashmir to, 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 to construction workers working on mm. road sites? Mm -hmm. What is the secret of this sensibility? Uh, well, I was very lucky to be, I mean, I visited all these places, you know. I was in Kashmir in uh, 1966. After my marriage, I went there. My husband was a civil engineer constructing bridges. I stayed with the workers in the barracks. And um, I learned a lot from them, their life. And so, you know, it is an entirely unique experience for me. I wrote my first novel, The Current of Sinab, with that experience. Unfortunately, my husband was killed in an accident there, but still I continued. I went to Ahiran, Madhya Pradesh. I wrote my novel on the workers of Ahiran Aqueduct. And they were, you know, they were migratory labor, mostly migratory laborers, when there were no union among them. And you can imagine when there were no union in the private companies, you can imagine the condition of the workers. Uh, when my husband was, uh, my husband uh, died in the, you know, while in duty, his compensation was only 10,000 rupees. He was a civil engineer, full-fledged, and um, you can imagine the condition of the laborers. In a sense, the, 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 strand in your, the strands in your novels and in your writing have been widowhood. <laughs> uh, you became a, you know, a, a, a widow very, very young, in a sense. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you have been looking uh, you know, at, at widowhood in different social contexts yes. across the landscape uh, mm -hmm. of, of India. Hmm. Uh, is there an, an India that emerges from this, this different experiences? Is widowhood different in Vrindavan to, to, to Madhya Pradesh or to Assam in some ways? <laughs> well, they a kind of, uh, you know, you can point out the similarities also. But I saw the agonies almost same everywhere. You know, when I was in Vrindavan, these widows used to come from East, at that time it was East Pakistan when I stayed there in 1970. They used to come from uh, those places in East Pakistan without any valid documents and uh, mostly from the place like Raj Sahi um, uh, and then Bakura from West Bengal. <coughs> and they, I personally used to feel that they were thrown out from the family and because of the financial you know, uh, uh, state, they had to come. And uh, staying with them, I could find uh, the, you know, difficulty which they have faced. And, um, you know, uh, uh, there are so many, you know, I have de described in detail. And in South Kamrup, I have written about the widows of South Kamrup in my no novel, Wei Kwa Hauda, the Mot Itin Hauda of a tasker. But what you know, sort of distinguishes that, your, your novels and your writing, hmm. uh, in some ways, is that beyond the, the sort of the physical description, which hmm. is very powerful, of course, hmm. of, you know, of widowhood, that you know, people are disowned, of, of being on one's own and no money and what have you, is the, emotion, is the intense emotional processes, the, the, the intense emotional agony of, 
<laughs> of aloneness, of, 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 of solitude, of abandonment. <laughs> so w what is, from your own experience of, <laughs> of widowhood, what is, is the most difficult part <laughs> uh, of, 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 of being left widowed? Uh, well, um, if you have a strength, you can live very thingly. And uh, I had so many friends, friends stayed with me. Then uh, I, uh, you know, I'm always studying. And I have, uh, you should always have a hobby or a kind of attachment towards um, something which we, but many, you know, uh, you know, people are different, the widows are different, uh, many are uneducated, Ill illiterate, they suffer. Uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, I feel that um, they wanted to find out a kind of path through which they can think of. They go to Vrindavan, then <laughs> here and there. And uh, so I found more agony among them, those who could not, um, you know, recline to some kind of. Uh, you know, hobbies or sadhana. So would you say, you just mentioned sadhana, and that's what I was coming to. <laughs> would you say then that this intense suffering that takes people to Vrindavan is seeking spirituality mm -hmm. in some ways uh, to explain and understand their predicament? And, mm. and what has been the consolation that spirituality has brought to you? Well, it is great. I cannot um, imagine of my life without the spirituality. I remember Radha Krishnan, and he used to say that if you become scientifically skilled and do not develop the other dimension of your soul and do not believe that besides knowledge there are other words like wisdom, you will become a monster, not the master of your life. Anyway, um, uh, you know, spirituality is not a religion. To me, it is a humanity, part of humanity. It uh, should be with you. Otherwise, I cannot imagine a person without uh, having kind of spiritual, you know, uh, kind of a spiritual flavor in him. What uh, was this, this aspect of spirituality or the quest or religion or the metaphysical that mm -hmm. when you were in Brindavan, mm -hmm. you spent, you know, more than a year living with a snake? <laughs> <laughs> that is in the and temple. You know, snake <laughs> is a very potent uh, symbol uh, in Indian mythology and spirituality. <laughs> so obviously something was going on there. What was going on? Uh, well, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm a great lover of animals. I'm strictly vegetarian. And uh, I wrote a novel called Shinnamasta. And it is about, uh, you know, prohibition of the buffalo sacrifice or animal sacrifice which is still going on in Kamekha temple. It created a quite a lot of uproar. For 2,000 years, nobody dared to write a novel. Uh, uh, nobody dared to write against animal sacrifice of Kamekha temple. I think you know Kamekha mm -hmm. is the greatest Sakti pit in India. And, um, but I was so, you know, from my, in my, if you have gone through my autobiography, mm -hmm. you will find how I used to, you know, run away from the, you know, place of sacrifice, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, and then uh, how I used to take shelter in Christ while reading Bible and that mm -hmm. something, you know, when I was very small, I gradually learned about Hinduism and um, the Ramayana, which I did my piece anyway, but then because my intense uh, thing for animal, yeah, I feel that um, it is a manifestation of the spirituality which is, uh, you know, always working in me. <laughs> you know, this is fascinating. You spend a year <laughs> and, and a half with the snake, and, 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 you, and, and this for you is an expression <laughs> of your love for animals. Uh, you're also obviously it's you know it's bad. Yes, I never used to feel afraid of uh, <laughs> snakes. Uh -huh. You are, uh, you know, for snake also I don't know why I have kind of sympathy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a part of you know you mentioned spirituality <laughs> and and apart from spirituality you also use the word sadhana. Hmm. So is there a, a, a spiritual sadhana that 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 you have a, a, a specific practice? 
you have often written about the you know the intense suffering and the many tragedies in your life <laughs> and how that uh, you know these have helped you apart from writing to to, <laughs> to to cope and to carry on and to and to transcend it so what is this what is the nature of this sadhana uh, well uh, sadhana you know actually uh, it is a kind of uh, you know when i was a very young girl my father used to ask me to sit 2 hours and study and gradually you go on increasing and when i started writing my novels and all my father used to say that you go on stay sitting for 4 or 5 hours you will um, you must love the subject and that is sadhana and you can go on increasing while uh, uh, the sadhana while uh, writing so you will be surprised to know but now in this age i can uh, sit for 12 hours 13 hours at a stress and write and it is uh, it is very difficult to say that whether it is a cultivation because love for the subject is always with it and i think it has to be a kind of cultivation mm -hmm. and with <laughs> love for the <laughs> so that that is that is the sadhana in a sense of your craft which is also mm -hmm. an expression of your being but I, i'm sort of more interested in 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 the internal sadhana you know the sadhana and that, that, that shapes you know, your mind that shapes your because my <laughs> you know writing itself things up mm -hmm. in my mind mm -hmm. it is a kind of uh, you know uh, i cannot define you mm -hmm. it is always there and mm -hmm. sadhana how can you define it i mean is there sort of like a ritual do you do a yoga do you do a prayer yes it is a kind of a ritual uh -huh. it uh -huh. is a i cannot even if for one day if i leave my sadhana i feel restless mm -hmm. and uh, so definitely it is a kind of yoga my you know my gurus is to say that yes uh, even writing is a yoga if you love it and if you go on doing it throughout it is a yoga that what uh, you know people is to say and i feel it is so that. you know i i noticed that you're wearing a number of uh, you know rings <laughs> <laughs> my on, my on your finger my mother has given is there me. an astrological <laughs> significance to these <laughs> well she used to say that this is for this and my horoscope you know not that satisfactory for her <laughs> but i'm very happy with my horoscope because <laughs> <laughs> i can write freely i can uh, uh -huh. think up and nothing is wrong but so do you feel that that the, that, that the great sort of the journey of your life you mm. know the 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 intense you know the, the the intense sense of suffering and and the overcoming of suffering that you're writing mm. uh encompasses uh has been sort of uh, the reason why you're such a great writer is suffering necessary to be a great writer i think it is inevitable mm. suffering is inevitable you know more of human being you know more of uh, you know well without suffering i personally feel that uh, one cannot be a very successful writer uh, i don't know there may be <laughs> some but for me uh, suffering is inevitable for a successful a great writer i'm not a great writer but then i feel that for <laughs> a great writer it is inevitable so does the process of writing yes. then work to understanding your suffering overcoming it resolving it what is the relationship it's obviously the material of your writing but how does it you know you when i meet you 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 know you're full of laughter you're full of joy you know despite as you have described you know a life of suffering and we'll come to the <laughs> life of the suffering in 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 a minute but in what ways is writing an instrument to transcend it is it catharsis is it bringing order is it understanding <laughs> no because while you love the subject you forget everything so you love suffering that's the subject of your much of even your writing. Uh, in my writing the suffering widows uh, you know the way they suffered the opium meters of south kamru how they suffered uh, um, share croppers when uh, you know they were thrown out from their land how they suffered you know while writing i feel uh, i am with the suffering of those people and um, so uh, it, it it always you know makes me forget everything forget your own uh, suffering my own suffering totally i forget uh -huh. what has <laughs> been the most intense <laughs> suffering in your own life intense suffering the most i mean you've had you know you 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 you've lost your husband you had difficulty with relationships uh what has been 
the most difficult part of your own life? Well, um, <laughs> you know, my family members are very cooperative. Always, they are so, I think, but then uh, uh, my husband was a very, you know, he was, a, he was a saintly type of man and when I lost him, I really suffered terribly. I didn't know that I would come out of that suffering. Then I lost my friend Kaikau Subarajur, he's a Pashi uh, gentleman, he stayed with us for so many years and in his death also, uh, you know, made me very, you know, totally, you know, I was uh, devastated. I mean, and um, then my brother, young brother, many that has made me suffer very intensely. And, uh, but then uh, I became more wise and uh, more, you know, detached. And uh, I think uh, it brought some kind of gravity towards my writing also. And uh, then uh, I, I have come to know more of life, that human life is like this. And uh, I, I, whatever I have, we have to, you know, think it, um, I mean, uh, we, we should spend it happily. Mm -hmm. And I try to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, Assamese writer, because you write in Assamese, but yes. in a sense you're an Indian writer, as mm -hmm. we, you know, you you've touched upon so many aspects. And, and I started this program by talking about how you were sort of offering uh, the Assamese a window to India and India a window to Assam. And, and in, in your incarnation as writer, as activist, you're now engaged in, 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 in facilitating a, a peace process, a peace yeah. dialogue mm -hmm. uh, between the government of India and mm -hmm. Ulfa. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? And, and how does a, a, a woman writer in Assam find herself in this role? Well, uh, it is naturally it came, and I knew this revolutionary youth for quite a long time. Now, 12 years ago, I wanted to write a book in the beginning, but beginning I was not that keen. But you know, whenever I go to Guwahati, this before these uh, students used to come and take me to various places for lectures, and uh, once such a, 12 years ago. Once they took me somewhere and telling me that it is a lecture on this subject, and I found that it is something else. And you were at an Ulfa training <laughs> camp. <laughs> something else, and they they told me that do you like to see the entire camp? I said yes, I would love to see. I saw that at that time they are doing many welfare jobs, uh, constructing roads, uh, making people aware of government grants. And then um, they are helping the flood affected people. I think you know about the flood. And um, you know, uh, in that way, they were doing quite a lot of uh, work and I was very much charmed by them at that time. And then what happened? Uh, that was a great experience uh, so many years uh, ago. And uh, the way I went to their camp when the army operation was taking place, in the uh, Darang district of uh, Assam. That night, how I came back with them, when the military, you know, trucks were almost seizing. Uh, I mean, it was a, <laughs> really, I cannot describe you how. So as the sort of the, the, the interlocutor <laughs> between the two, sort of, you know, the, the government of India, and 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 the and, and the Ulfa, <laughs> and, and there is a great sense of great sensitivity now about the potential alienation of people from the northeast. What do you think is the real source uh, of the conflict? Well, uh, you know, uh, from the very beginning, this uh, the thought of alienation was very very strong among Assamese people. They find it that they were neglected. I must tell you. There yeah, are many points where it is so genuine. You know, in the history books all over India, we grew up with uh, the knowledge of, say, uh, various civilizations like Marathas, Vijayanagar Kingdom, Portuguese connection, and so many things. But the Ahoms who ruled Assam for 600 years, and uh, during their time, the culture prospered like anything. 
there is no mention of anything in any book, any Indian book or any way, why this thing has happened. Then um, chronicle writings. You know, Sir George Grierson has written very well, uh, very distinctly in his linguistic survey that Assamese are justly proud of their national literature. This is Chronicles. And um, at that time, no India, I mean, other languages were not flourishing in this particular in chronicle writing. There is no mention from 12th, uh, 13th century onward, this chronicle writing is uh, going on. And then, uh, you know, there's a different department in our home kingdom about chronicle writing. So, what ha so this, there is this, this, this sense of neglect that, that people in India, you know, don't feel that Assam is, is emotionally, intellectually integrated. And, you know, that's, that's the perception in Assam. Uh, at, at this time, and apart from the, you know, the specifics, which I won't sort of draw you into because you're sworn to secrecy <laughs> uh, in, in terms of the dialogue between uh, the government of India and uh, Ulfa, what are the kinds of things uh, that mm. you feel uh, that, that, that India can do and the Assamese might do uh, to bring about long-term uh, rapprochement? Yeah, that's what I'm trying so much, you know, uh -huh. as a writer. Uh, you know, I, while writing the book on al uh, alphas, um, while I'm trying, uh, I found that uh, unofficial reports said about 10,000 each were killed and about 30,000 wounded. It's an unofficial report. I found that gradually they are, it is, they are come, you know, a best part of our society are coming to an end. And every day the encounters are going on now. The air bomb <laughs> blast is going on. So I thought that there should be a peace process. And since our Honorable Prime Minister Manmohan Singh also worked with us in Delhi University, and he is a nobleman, I know. And I thought that definitely he will hear our appeal. I had that courage with me. And so I took the appeal, and, I, and then I, he went through. And he said, in my tenure, I'm going to mm -hmm. do something. I was very happy. Mm -hmm. and so what would you like them to do? Well, they should <laughs> come to a table. Okay. Mm -hmm. They should come to table. They should discuss. They should, um, you know, there should be discussion on their core issue. Maybe it is sovereignty or, or mm -hmm. it is a core issue. So they should discuss about it, find out the um, solutions. Uh, I mean, in that way, definitely something will come, I feel, because 27 years nobody has listened to them. And uh, they have not come for, you know, discussion in the table. And nobody even tried so honestly, probably. They wanted to try, probably, but then also, so as I did, uh, for last nearly one year it will be. And, <laughs> Tell uh, me you write But so then one thing you mm -hmm. must remember mm -hmm. that I'm not a mediator. I mean, I, I just wanted to bring them to table and I want that there should be other people also to help them in their <laughs> you know, in the context of this interface between your Assamese uh, sensibility and the mm -hmm. Indian sensibility, what, what is unique is that, that distinguishes the Assamese uh, sensibility? Oh. What do you feel is the most <laughs> Assamese part of you? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I feel that, you know, these Ahoms who ruled Assam for so many years, they had a kind of, you know, system where there is no caste system. You will not find dowry in Assam. Uh, when you go through the Ramayana, which was written in 14th century, it was the first Ramayana written in modern Indo-Aryan language, you will find the women. They had a political power also. So uh, they, are, uh, and they were not tortured by any ruling class the way some parts of India has been. Uh, in, uh, it happened in some part of India. So would you describe yourself uh, as an Assamese feminist? Absolutely. I'm not a feminist at all. <laughs> I'm a humanist. And um, mm -hmm. Assamese, I have some kind of, you know, definitely I'm Assamese, but then feminist is, I cannot uh, think of. Okay, you know, sort of you, your, your, your autobiography mm -hmm. uh, is called sort of an unfinished autobiography, and you've just, you know, you're in the process of publishing uh, a second volume. 
And in a sense, every autobiography has to be unfinished because, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, God, nobody can ever complete there. But, but if someone were to complete or want mm. to complete your uh, unfinished autobiography or the last volume of the unfinished autobiography, what kind of epitaph, what would you want them to say about you? What would you want to be remembered as? Remember that? <laughs> yes, what would be the conclusion that you would like well, to Well, uh, they should remember me as uh, that they here lies a humanist, a real humanist. And I'm, mm, uh, yeah, that only I want, uh, nothing else. Mm -hmm. That is the only word I want for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indra, thank you very much. This thank has been you. a great thank privilege. Thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> thank you.